Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Honor the Feminine podcast. I'm your host, Shannon Ledford, and today we have Kimberly Johnson with us, and I'm really excited to drop in with her. As you know, we start each episode with an image and story from my travels, because when I was traveling and out in the world is when I really started to hear my intuition again. When I got out of the day-to-day chaos and noise and expectations, I started to hear her whispers. I know she was always there, but she'd just gotten muffled. So today, our image is called Sensual Lineage. It was taken at Bante Sri, temples of Angkor in Cambodia. The intricately carved pink sandstone of Bante Sri is touted as the artistic jewel of all of the temples of Angkor. From the outside, it appears very small and perhaps not worth the 30-kilometer tuk-tuk journey, but the incredible carvings and stories told on its walls are well worth the voyage. The detail must have taken Khmer craftsmen endless hours to portray their reverence to sensuality. The craftsmen's devotion to the sensual myths of Khmer history of the demons and the goddess could be felt. These are the preserved reminders my, reminders of our global lineage of sensuality, and now is a time of deep remembering. This is the image that reminds me of our guest today, Kimberly Johnson. Kimberly, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Oh, I'm excited about it. So share yourself with us. Tell us about you. Hmm. Me. How? Me. Which me? What What part of me? <laughs> What what you is on your heart most at the moment? <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm in love with your work, so you can talk about the beautiful service you do to the world with your work. Well, I'm really on fire about ushering women holding, you know, the proverbial lamp on the path towards full sexual expression. And to me, that means um, uninhibited, safe willingness to walk the resilient edge of resistance and question the scripts that we've inherited both personally and culturally and religiously and be able to claim not only our pleasure, but actually you know, it's kind of, to me, it's beyond pleasure and beyond sovereignty. It's, it's really like claiming authenticity, claiming a, an unwillingness to perform, an unwillingness to bow to what we think we're supposed to be or what we think, you know, the relationships the, that we've formed that in some ways are inaccurate mirrors of who we really are. And to continue to be radically honest with ourselves about what is true in our life at each moment. And so sexual engagement just happens to be one of those places where the unconscious is most available. And, you know, it's it's more available in birth and death. But since birth and death only happen a couple of times in our lifetime, unless we choose like to be a doula and then we're in that birth space more often. Um, but sexuality and sexual intimacy is sort of the, in some ways, the most convenient, um, the most accessible, the most present and therefore to me, one of, you know, and fascinating and therefore the space that I like to encourage people to move into so that they can feel more of themselves. Yeah, it feels like that the sensuality and the sexuality like touches all areas of our lives and that as we've turned it off in some ways for whatever reason, we die a little bit, like we kill a little bit of ourselves. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's, you know, I don't know if it's all the way dead or if, if it's just, you know, 
ashes buried way far. And I always think of it as like sex is kind of like a suitcase and there's that stuff that's in that back pocket that always just like the dust that always stays there, but it's still there. Um, you know, but you never actually really clean it out. That's there with like, you know, a dental floss and a lipstick that you're always like, Oh yeah, that's where that lipstick is. Um, (laughs) but for sure it's, you know, I tell everyone, like, get out of therapy and get into the bedroom or get in therapy with somebody who's going to teach you about touch because the place where we're at in our culture, where we're just, we're like worshipers of the mind and not the mind in the Buddhist sense of a heart mind, but we're like, we're like brain worshipers. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, the feminine is about coming into the body, is about, you know, honoring the body however it is and the wisdom that's in it like we think the body is just this thing that we can see and that you know carries us around but actually it is the microcosm of the whole universe and it's what we have to perceive through and sure our mind is interpreting some of that but uh eventually it's really our body that has the honest answers for us and so are you finding that the women that you work with don't feel safe? And is there a sense of shame around sensuality? Uh, yes, to both of those questions. Um, safety almost always enters the space. Uh, it's inevitable as a woman in the culture that we live in. And just because we feel safe with one person in one place one day doesn't mean the next day we're going to feel safe. Um, when we push into the resilient edge of resistance, which is just at the edge of our comfort zone into something that is maybe the reason that it's erotic is because it seems slightly dangerous or threatening. And there will be points where we're expanding our bandwidth of activation, like just an amount of arousal, even in a positive direction that registers as threat to our system. It's going beyond what we have accommodated before. And Therefore, will stretch us if it's well dosed. Um, but every, I mean, uh, I do internal pelvic floor work in large parts of my sessions are sometimes I never even, like a person never even takes off their clothes because creating safety and on every level, like maybe mentally they feel safe because their best friend came to see me and then they listen to my podcast, but their body does not feel safe and it's evident to both of us. Their legs are trembling or they're dissociated. And there's earlier experiences that are arising just in the space of an intimate exchange, even though I work in general outside of an arousal context. You know, how many, how many pap smears have women had that were really uncomfortable and unpleasant, like abortions, miscarriages, gynecological procedures. And so you come into a space where you're trusting someone that you don't know with the most intimate part of your body, safety is going to be number one. And uh, it doesn't always, people will say, well, you know, I didn't have any sexual abuse or I didn't have this. Yeah, but we live in a society that we, it's like, I say this all the time, like we live in gravity on earth. We live in a gravitational field and we don't know what it would like be like to be outside of gravity unless we were an astronaut. So we've never had an experience outside of gravity. That's like shame in our culture. We don't have a reference point for sexuality without shame. We just don't have it. It doesn't exist. And so it's like to have a shameless experience would be like, you know, putting yourself in a completely in an in in space. And so even if someone says, you know, I have a lot of people with religious backgrounds And they'll say, well, yeah, my parents are Catholic, but like, I don't believe any of that stuff. And like, you know, I thought everybody knew that didn't work. Yet their body is still not opening or they're still not having experiences that they want to have because the shame is in their body. And that's really common. You know, I was raised, my dad is a preacher and I was raised Baptist. And it's like, there's still a coupling of letting someone into your body and being bad or and and they're confounded because they're like, I'm married and I'm monogamous and like I should totally want to be with my husband. And yet still I'm up against this feeling of shame or whatever other things come up. Okay. So can you talk to us a little bit about your journey from a preacher's daughter? Because I just. No, I'm not a preacher's no. daughter. Okay. No. Okay. Mm-mm. 
I was like, oh, that, that would be a very interesting turn. But can you talk about your journey to this? Because we all have this shame, right? And mm-hmm. so what was that sort of turning point for you to be like, well, I'm I'm done with this. Like, it, like, this is enough. Not that it doesn't come back around, not that you erase it completely, but to really speak into all the time around empowering women in this. Like, I I imagine there was a point where you had a shift. Like, are you asking when I had a shift where I felt empowered and safe enough myself to speak out about my sexuality and my views about sex? Yeah, like, yeah. I, I guess I'm just trying to feel into... Um, for those women that are listening, that um, that that all of the the shame and the feeling unsafe mm-hmm. is up, right? Like, did you have a time in your life that felt like that? And and what were those first things that started to shift? So, I everything that I've ever done in my life, like every let's say profession or calling or however you want to look at it, both of those things. I've always, I've always offered that, which gave me the most healing. So my sexual life started off. My first real sexual experience was sexual assault. And so right at that time, and, and I, before that time I was, I, in high school, I never had any boyfriends or dates. I was, um, I grew up in Southern California where everyone's blonde and beach bodies and, um, I have red hair, freckles, and I'm just like not a typical Southern Californian. And I was really, I'm really smart. So I was like always really smart. And, and I actually, because of some earlier childhood experiences where I skipped a grade in school and I ended up very young in the classes I was in, I, my mind was my refuge because it was safer for me to be Mm -hmm. smart and to, to be like a teacher's pet than it was to have friends because I was six years old in a class with eight and nine year olds and I just wasn't relating to it and I didn't know how to interact with them. So really early on, I learned that I got a lot of praise for being really smart. And my mind felt like a safer place to be than my body or my heart, because my heart was kind of getting broken by wanting friends and not being able to make friends easily. And just feeling out of place, basically, just like, you know, even when I was in high school, I graduated from high school when I was 16. And I went to college at 17. You know, some of the guys in my class were like 19. So when I started high school, I was 14, my best friends were all like 16 and 17. And I remember like they would be like, oh, I have a crush on so-and-so. And And I would just kind of go along with the crushes that they had because I was like, I don't even really know if I have a crush on anyone. Like I didn't even, (laughs) it was like I just was out of sync. Yeah. So when I got to college, I went to school on the East Coast and all of a sudden I was like, I had three guys ask me out the first week of college and I'd never been asked out even one time on a date before. So I was completely unprepared and I was just like, I didn't even know, like, what should I do? Should I say, like, what does this mean? Am I allowed to say yes? I probably shouldn't do this because what if I get a boyfriend and then I I need to have friends first and like, how am I going to choose between them? Because they were all super nice guys and interesting and, um, and so it was just, it was like a, a lack of practice. Like I had missed a whole phase of life of experimentation and practice and, and feeling what's a yes and what's a no. And, and I was a real good girl. I was a perfectionist. I, I escaped my family life by being perfect. I just excelled at everything, played three sports, was on, you know, model United Nations dance. And so I wasn't prepared for relationship and negotiating boundaries. And I really had a belief that like, if you did the right thing, and you were good, that the right thing would happen. So when I was assaulted, my world turned upside down. And I realized, like, I didn't understand, like, I felt like I was a good person. Like, why would, why would such a bad thing happen to me? And from there, I the next 
you know, I went on to have some relationships and my relationships were usually screwed up because I always really wanted a baby since I was like 16. And so every person I got in relationship with, I, all I really was interested in was knowing like, were they going to be the one that was going to give me the baby? And now I realize it was also because I had a lot of attachment issues that I wasn't aware of that. And I was in like that meant security and that meant foundation to me. But of course it ruined every relationship because right away that was already kind of even energetically just coming into play. And then I eventually had a baby and my pelvic floor got completely torn and I was already a yoga teacher and a body worker for a long time. And I found myself in a situation where I had no idea how to heal myself and I was told I needed surgery and I knew that I didn't want surgery, which is why I'd had a home birth in the first place. And I started to realize I separated from my daughter, daughter's father, like, how am I going to have an erotic life and be a single parent? Like, I don't have time to date. I don't have money for a babysitter. I am a mo mother to a daughter. And this part of me is very important to me. And so like, how am I going to do that? And then I just started experimenting and started um, really looking at, because when I had a baby, I realized I was 32. And I realized at the time, I took a real risk on the partner. Like I wasn't sure the partnership was going to work out, but I knew I wanted the baby. And so I started looking at relationship like, well, what am I looking for? Am I looking for attachment? Am I looking for pleasure? Am I looking for connection? Am I looking for emotional support? Am I looking for sex? And kind of getting really specific about what those things were. And then as I started to talk to other women and I started doing the internal pelvic floor work because that's how I healed myself. Uh -huh. I just, people just started, to, you know, when you're in the territory and you're actually touching someone in the, in their vagina and vulva, just people just start telling their stories and it, and it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking to hear how little education we have, how many expectations there are. It's like the blind leading the blind, you know, like everyone's got all of these programs running that are unconscious and that they're not content with, but they feel they have to do. And I just was like, along that way, constructing my own erotic identity. And then it, I guess it was maybe two years ago. I mean, I only said like, just recently, maybe four months ago, I was teaching a workshop. And at the end, I just felt really moved to, to share that it's possible to have your full sexual expression. And I know that because I have it. And I just felt like I needed to say that because I needed people to know that I, like I've emerged from that predator prey dynamic. I'm not afraid of men anymore. I'm not afraid of being in a room with sexual energy and sexual arousal. And I know that I can hold my own and I know what my boundaries are and I can, I can protect myself or ask for protection if I need it. And I realized that that is so far away from what most people's experiences are, even if they haven't had what they're considering to be abuse, that I needed to start talking about it more and more because it's a silent epidemic. It's a silent epidemic of people that are in complicit in dynamics that are not life enhancing that are causing them suffering. And so some people are just in flat out pain. They're having terribly painful sex because they think that that is, they think their partner wants that thing. And then I say to them, but do they know how much pain you're in? And they're like, no. And I'm like, and if you ask them, do they want this? Even if you are in excruciating pain, do you, what do you think they would say? And they say, I don't think they'd want it. And it's like, well, then you need to stop doing it. You know? And so, so many ways and justifications and rationalizations and ways that we've manipulated with our sexuality, ways we've denied ourselves with our sexuality, relationships we've constructed around those lies that now are like 10 years in and we're having to like, now how do you be honest about what you really feel? Mm -hmm. And, and I know that, you know, in a country where one out of seven people, women is being diagnosed with postpartum depression and something really fucking crazy, like one in 10 doctor's visits of any kind 
are for are results in antidepressants. That means like you go to the doctor because you've got like an anal fissure and they're like, here's an antidepressant. Or you go because you've got like, you know, a skin thing on your back and they're like, here's an antidepressant. I know it's directly related because we're so distanced from this basic bodily, and I'm not even going to call it a need because actually sex is not a basic human need. Sexual expression is a basic human need. But we're so distant just from these base level desires. When I just ask somebody, like, what do you want? Like, what do you really want? What does your body want? Sometimes people just sit in my office and cry for 40 minutes because they just, they don't even know. They, they can't imagine what it is that they want if they just have to choose something that's for themselves. Mm. Whew. Yeah. And it's all starting with that disconnect from our bodies and the messages that are so, I mean, our bodies are so smart (laughs) and you're right. And I've, I can really relate to that, like being in your head and losing all the rest. And so my journey over the last few years has been first to my heart and now to my womb space, you know, to where there's that part that um the shadow of that has felt um unsafe or mm-hmm. um or that old story around but if i'm enlightened and spiritual i want to just be in the light right and not in the in the darkness and my womb's about the shadow and i'm i'm i've gotten so much medicine and beautiful lessons from that over the last mm. you know year and a half or so In my experience, the people who are really drawn to spirituality, especially women, are it's a direct correlate to trauma. It's a much safer place to be, and it feels unsafe to be in the pelvis and to be in the body. And so it's a bypass. And so if you just go into spirituality, then we don't have to deal with both our personal experiences because our pelvis is holding every every experience that we've ever had. And then it's also holding the collective. And let's face it, like on a collective level, it's not going that well right now for women and worldwide. And like, look at our world leadership. Like in Brazil, there was a female president. She just got impeached. And now there's like a super ultra conservative, all white cabinet, even though it's a 52, a nation with 52% African derived people. We have our president here. We have, you know, I mean, it's like worldwide, there's a big backlash. And so we have access as women to that collective condition and, and, and we also have impact over it. So the extent to which we're able to go in there and transmute and alchemize is also the extent to which that's rippling out. Yeah. Oh, yeah. (laughs) That's beautiful. Um, can we speak into a little bit about postpartum? Because um, I've spoken a little bit on the podcast around the the new normal of everything, of my body, of the sex life with my husband, of that bringing up the some of the, the shame and stuff that I was holding and continue to work through around my sensuality. Mm-hmm. So postpartum is a very special time where every layer of ourselves is very porous. So what we take in oftentimes stays in and we have to be very conscientious and protective. I mean, ideally we would be protected instead of have to protect. Um, Same with the birth space. But that's not really what's happening right now in our Mm. culture. Um, The idea with postpartum, and first of all, like also, I'm really, the most people are using the word postpartum as synonymous with depression these days. Like, oh, did you have postpartum? Oh, yeah, my so-and-so had postpartum. It just (laughs) is the time after you have a baby, you know. And, And as far as I'm concerned, postpartum depression is not a mental health problem a women's mental health problem. Postpartum depression is a cultural deficit. It's a, it's a, it's a sign of an unhealthy 
society where we are not working together collectively to support new life. And we are not recognizing the interconnectedness and the preciousness of not just a baby's life, but a mother's life. And that taking care of a mother when she has a new baby means taking care of relationships, means taking care of families, and means taking care of our planet. And if we don't get in right relationship with that, we're going to see more and more women being depressed because that depression is coming from depletion. It's coming, a lot of women are, are um, experiencing autoimmune conditions that are arising after having children because they're getting pushed over the threshold. And then all of the expectations that are, we place on ourselves and that are placed on us that, you know, you know, we ought to do it all. We've got creative lives and we've got work lives and now we've got family lives and then we've got partnership lives and there's so much pressure, um, to do it, to do everything. And we can't do everything. So in this space where we are like, you know, we're like soft clay, we're being remolded into this new person. We don't want the same things we wanted before. We're not, our body is not the same. Perhaps we have an injury. Perhaps there was trauma during the birth, which is pretty common now because birth is not in a great place either. And so we really have to provide women with what they need so they can emerge from that time more radiant, more whole and stronger. And when they are, when they emerge that way, the partnership also emerges more intact. Because what happens is when a woman's not getting what she needs, she's not getting adequate nutrition, she doesn't have um, spiritual companionship, she doesn't have wise women around, she's not getting enough rest, then that's a, a lot of the anxiety gets displaced on the partner. And um, unnecessarily so. And then, then you have an unstable parental unit at a time when actually that's the top of the pyramid. Like that's what created the baby in the first place. And the baby needs that loving, connected, supportive parents for each other, not for the baby. So it requires a different way of, you know, the, the mother is martyr is just such a strong archetype for us. And that means sacrifice everything, sacrifice your bodies, you know, feed the baby first like take care of everybody else. And it tends to be like that. I see it so much because I'm working in people's pelvic floor. It's like people will be like, oh yeah, I've been incontinent for, you know, I've been wetting my pants for two years and like I've, I've had sex four times and it's super painful, but it hasn't even like come to the surface enough for them to know they should address it because it's just getting pushed to the side while they're in survival mode with everything else. We're going to take a sacred pause right here and drop into visioning for just a moment. Ava and I did a bonus episode recently on visioning and why it's become so important to us around setting up a structure that we can flow into in the coming year. And I'm wondering about, do you vision? Do you set a structure? How in advance do you set a structure? Do you have some tools to do that? Um, I have been visioning for a number of years, but it's, it's changed over time. And I love dropping into new ways. And, and the way that we're visioning this year is on a, a big vision macro level and then getting down to the micro level, the ins and outs and the details and the timings to really set the structure. If you would like to do that with us, we are we're sort of opening the vaults to the behind the scenes. So if you're listening to this in real time at the end of November 2017, we are offering a virtual visioning session with us. It's a group session on Sunday, December 3rd. And it's going to be really fun. And it's not going to be a how to, it's going to be a jump in. So it's going to be three hours of really jumping in and you will leave with a really good sense of your vision for 2018 and, and how you're going to start to really flow into that. And for me, that creates enthusiasm and it's been really, really fun. So if that sounds exciting to you, if you want to ignite your vision for 2018, I invite you to come over to rememberingdivineunion.com and sign up to join us. All right, back to the show. 
And so some phrases like low libido or I'm touched out become the only language people have to express the fact that really what they're saying is, I don't know who I am. I don't want the sex I was having before, but I have no idea to ask, how to ask for anything different. So it's easier just to say no to it and avoid. Because I and don't use have the these time words. or energy to look any deeper in this moment. Yeah. And, I, and, and as women, we have to be the leaders. So yeah. uh, the, the partners are everybody. I mean, really, everyone says the same thing to me. I don't have many clients who have like asshole partners. They all say the same thing. My husband is so patient, but I don't know how long he's going to wait. I feel so terrible for him. You know, da, 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 da. And, you know, first things first is like everyone's in charge of their or own orgasm. Like I'm in charge of my orgasm. You're in charge of your orgasm. Like no one's in charge of anyone else's orgasm. But also women really need to sit with the question of what kind of sex is nourishing, what will give them the energy that they want, not I'm exhausted or I'm touched out. Yeah, but you know, when you first met your partner, you could have been exhausted, but you'd miss work, you'd stay up all night, you'd do all kinds of things so that you could have more sex well, for a lot of people. I mean, not everybody, but you know, um, so what is the kind of touch that you want? that would make you feel excited and would make you feel like you have energy for your day and you have an image in your mind that you can go back to and, you know, putting some attention into that rather than everything you don't want. Cause that's our conditioning. I don't want this. No, no, no. But like, what's a yes. And most women say, well, I don't want to say that. Cause if I say, well, okay, I want my head rubbed, then he's going to think that that's going to go somewhere. And then that pressure already kills it for me. Or like, I don't want a back rub because then he's going to get a hard on and then I'm going to feel bad and da da da. But again, we have to like rein it in and take responsibility for our own experience and what we, what we really do want and being honest about that. I love the reframe of what would be nourishing? Like, what would feel nourishing? And the space and permission to ask that question, you know, in this, in the arena of sex, where mm -hmm. we may be asking that in other, in other ways, right? Like, oh, what kind of self care can I, can I do or can I carve out time for? But we miss it in this arena a lot. And I would, suggest that this is a better place to start because getting a manicure and, you know, whatever else people are doing, that's self-care. It's not going to touch the amount of satisfaction you're going to get out of a genuine connection with your partner. Our lives just don't go that well when we're disconnected from our partners. I mean, I don't have a partner, but I, I see it because I work with people and I see what's happening. Like if your home life is not connected, it's reflected in the rest of your life. And you can do all the things you want, go on girls night out and date night and blah, blah, blah. But if you're avoiding that real fundamental connection, and I'm not, like I said, I'm not talking about penis and vagina penetrative sex. I'm talking about dropping in with somebody and, and being real about what you want and what sounds interesting. And, you know, and also knowing that just because someone wants something doesn't mean you have to give it to them. I want this and you, okay, interesting. And then the other person says, I want that. And then both of you might not want what either of the other of you want, but at least you've actually checked in and found something that you want and had the courage to express it. God, that's so good. And, and you're right. I mean, I can, I can feel in my marriage, there are, um, there's also this, this ebb and flow of connection some, like there are times when we feel much more connected and then there's mm -hmm. times when we feel a little less connected. And if that little less connected goes on for too long, I, I'm the first to voice, Hey, I'm feeling super disconnected. Like we, can we do something here? Like, can we feel mm -hmm. into this together? <laughs> yeah. And I love the way you're saying that. Cause it's just your own experience. You're not blaming, you're not saying, you know, and you're not like, it's not moral. It's just like, this is how I'm feeling. And this is something for us to look at together. Like, that's what I say about the sex question, too. Like, I think at some point, every new parents are gonna say something like, I don't know how to do sex anymore. 
I don't know what it looks like, but can we explore this together? What are your ideas? Oh, what are your ideas? What do you think might be interesting? What do you think might be interesting? You know, it's have to be an open conversation. Yeah. It's not one person's job. And that's, that's the thing though, as women, we just take on so much responsibility. So we think it's there. We think there's something wrong with us because we don't want what we wanted before. So there's the shame about that. And then for some women, body image plays huge into this. And so they're like, oh, they don't think they're attractive because of this or this or this. And then they just are getting more and more distant from being able to just have an unhindered, expressive experience. Um, but at some point, it's like just naming, like, I don't know how to do this. You know? <laughs> but I think part of that goes back to this idea that like, um, that that story that we have that like, uh, sex is a is a need, you know, it's like a you know, one of those fundamental needs and we should just know how to, to do it. Right. Mm. And so it's stepping back. Well, I'm here story. to tell you that nobody knows how to do it because <laughs> in my office, like I, there's no other category on earth where there is less coherence between what is being shown to the outer world and what's actually happening. It, there's just no relationship. People can look super sexy and, and from the outside you're going like, wow. And then they're like, come in my office and they're like, I've never had an orgasm. And you're just like, wow. Okay. And then there can be someone who like, you might think is like dumpy and out of shape and like kind of a wallflower. And they come in and they're like having the most like erotic, interesting, like they're being worshiped and they're totally fulfilled. It's like, there's no correlation between how fat you are, how skinny you are, how whatever muscular you are, how un whatever, there's no correlation between that and how much pleasure you can experience. There's just zero. It has nothing to do one with the other. And everyone's thinking that everybody else is doing better than they are. There are everybody's thinking that everyone else is having better sex or everyone else has like figured it out. And nobody has I mean, there's no other what other arena is gonna be more awkward? Like, you got to be awkward. You got to be willing to just like, when you try, like anal sex, you got to be awkward. Like, you got to slow it down and you've got to like narrate how you're feeling and tell the other person micro adjustments so that it can be pleasurable. Well, that's all. I mean, people, you feel awkward because I think men more than women feel performance anxiety. Like, they should know how to do it. Plus, most of them are watching a lot of imagery of how to do it. And so, they would think, well, I should know because I've watched it. But that has nothing to do with actually being with another human in every layer of our magnificence. I mean, it's not like we're not just having a sexual experience with our body. We're having it with every layer of ourselves. So there's all kinds of imagery, sensation, memories, everything that comes into play with it. Hmm. Which is why it's like a kaleidoscope and why it's never – when you really come into the present moment and you meet in that moment, it can never be boring. I'm like, I don't understand why people need multiple partners. Cause I'm like, if you're like, how, like, I mean, as, as women, we're like as variety as it comes. If, if we allow ourselves to be wild, not if we've decided that like only, you know, it's like, I don't want any hair out of place. Cause I, if I have hair out of place, like that's not perfect. And like, Oh no, I don't have a, my wax isn't good. And like, Oh, maybe I smell a little. And you know, like not a, not if we're like self-conscious and judging ourselves and, you know, feel like we have to wear heels and lingerie to be a great fuck, you know, not like that. But we have access, like you're saying, you know, we have access to the high goddesses and we have access to the dark goddesses and we have access to all of those archetypes within our sexuality. And that's the fun of it. And when you're able to access that, there's just all there's always novelty because it's never it's never the same. Yeah, gorgeous. Oh my god, like I don't know. This whole thing's like enlivening parts of me. Even this, it's really fun. Yeah. <laughs> Can you talk to us a little about how you honor the feminine and stay in touch with your intuition? Sounds like your body is pendulum, maybe part of it. <laughs> yeah, I mean. 
I mostly am just checking in with my body a lot in in the spaces where my nervous system feels settled. And I my mantra is kind of choose with my nervous system. And I grew up in an alcoholic family, so and my grandparents are also alcoholics. So I grew up in a family environment with a lot of tension and a lot of charge. And so I'm used to that high level of activation. So it makes sense that in my relationships, I chose addicts and I chose very volatile. Not, I mean, not like I didn't choose like screaming and yelling or like, you know, abusive relationships, but just relationships where people's internal world were very unsettled. And as I get older and, you know, I'm a mother now and my daughter's almost 10 years old and I'm, you know, my career is in a different spot. It's just, I'm continually just listening to my nervous system and like, and, and becoming more normal. Like it was a really big deal for me this year. I allowed my daughter to get, we're pet sitting. They're not our pets, but like I allowed her to pet sit because I would never want pets because I didn't want the responsibility. I didn't want to like have to come home every day. Um, I didn't want routine. And it was when I realized when I heard myself saying yes to that, I was like, wow, like this is really working because I'm becoming more normal. Like I'm becoming more satisfied with just the basic things of life. And um, I don't need so much traveling. I was always traveling all the time and (laughs) needing novelty, needing I I went after I got sexually assaulted, I went to India by myself and I was 19 and I put myself in a lot of dangerous situations. And my intention of going by myself was so that I could prove to myself I could protect myself. But at the same time, I also was attracting really dangerous situations. And luckily, I never got reassaulted. But I had a lot of close calls that just weren't necessary. But because I was in that matrix of my nervous system that's what I kept attracting and so it's it's a real relief to feel in and be like you know what like like I just ended a relationship based on my nervous system that was the best relationship I've ever had and wonderful in almost every way but in one area it just would not I I couldn't relax and it was because of incoherence in this person's behavior that was just not allowing my system to downregulate. And I was like, you know, I can't drain my energy like that. Like I have to be intact to be able, you know, it's, it's intense work to lead people on this journey. When you start working in the realms of sexuality, you know, in, in, in astrology, death and sexuality are in the same house. Mm -hmm. The eighth house. Um, Of course, that's where my Scorpio is. So it's like I'm (laughs) – yeah. Um, I traverse those realms and I transmute in those realms. And there's a lot of intensity. It's a lot to sit and hold people's sexual stories because we've all been through a lot. And it tends to be the place where – you know, I I often think that women should write their sexual autobiographies because I think that it would actually probably end up being their spiritual autobiography. Everyone wants to write their spiritual one, but if they actually were honest about their sexual one, they'd probably learn a lot about themselves and about these unhealed parts of ourselves that are asking to be seen. Oh, just thinking about my sexual autobiography makes me squirm a little. <laughs> So I should yeah. probably write it. That's how I know. <laughs> mm-hmm. can write a little. It's interesting, too, when you talked about, you know, we don't know what gravity doesn't feel like. <clears throat> when you're in that state of sort of high activation all the time, you don't know what feeling settled feels like. Mm-hmm. Because it's not, you've never felt it in your body. So... And sometimes if you do feel it, it doesn't feel comfortable. You know, like the famous end of yoga class, Shavasana, it's like the least relaxing part of class for some people. Like, I don't want to lay here and be still. Like, this feels terrible. It feels unsafe. I'm like, here I am, my like belly to the sky. And I don't know anybody here, you know, like, and that's supposed to, but yet you're getting the message that you're supposed to be totally relaxed. And this is supposed to be your favorite part of class. And, you know, 
the most important. So, but I think people do know what it means to be settled in because people gravitate towards the nervous systems of people who are settled. Mm. And I think collectively there's a shift so that there's more of that resonance in our world. Even though on the surface it can look like perhaps there's less. Mm. I can feel that there's there's pockets of more. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Are you ready for the random questions? Sure. <laughs> So if you could sit down with any woman, alive or dead, for a chat and tea, who would it be? Hmm. I mean, the first person who came to mind was Angela Davis. Mm -hmm. Um, But I imagine that if I actually did sit down to tea with her, I probably would just be completely clumped like I probably wouldn't even know what to say so I'm not sure that would be an awesome tea date because I would just be like in awe um (laughs) sometimes with women that are powerful or you know that, that have that effect on us it's just being in their presence that matters you know yeah I'd like to have a talk with Erica Badu, and I and I intend to have one soon. Um, yes, trying to manifest that. So, you know, she's an incredible artist. She's a mother. She's a doula. She somehow early on in her life already had the the thing that I think a lot of women don't get until their forties or fifties, which is just like not giving a fuck about what people think about her and just being mm-hmm. herself and being out there and. Um, and I just, I love the fact that she, I mean, she's also stunningly gorgeous, but I think it's, yeah, I I love her artistry and I love the way that she navigates her fame, but also is still, you know, works in the doula world, but also doesn't like, there's not like a million articles being written about her about that. I think she has a great level of like discretion and privacy at the same time as she's, everything she does is very impactful. Yeah, I didn't realize she was a doula, but I'll hold that intention with you that you get a get to talk with her and drop in with her. That'll be that'd be fun. That would be fun. It'll happen. Oh, I can feel it. Totally yeah. a matter of when. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> the second question is, where would you most like to travel? Ah. <sighs> Right now, um, I would go to the Amazon, I think. Mm. I lived in Brazil for eight years, and I just have a love affair with Brazil itself. Mm -hmm. And I've been having dreams about the Amazon, and uh, I want my daughter's Brazilian, so I want her to get Mm. to know more parts of the country So I think that's what I would choose. I was in Brazil at one point many years ago, and I loved the beaches of Brazil on the weekends. (laughs) I loved that. That says a lot about you. Like just knowing that really says a lot about you. Like the people watching and the, the sensuality that went on on the beaches, like it didn't matter if a woman was stick, thin, or what we would call fat or beef, whatever. Everybody loved their body. It was so gorgeous. And I actually loved the ethnic and cultural interaction because you not only did you have every body type, but you had women that were the whitest white to the to the darkest black and every shade in between. And I just, oh, I loved that about the beaches of Brazil. <laughs> Yeah, it's radical. It's totally radical seeing like someone who would be considered like someone who here, somebody would roll their eyes and be like, they shouldn't be wearing that. It's like they're they're like owning it and like standing up because everyone stands up on the beach. And then I don't know if you ever saw people painting themselves with the peroxide to dye their hair Mm. and like just completely like, yeah, it's it's 
it's radical for sure. It's a very strange, um, there's a lot of paradoxes in Brazilian culture because at the same time as there, there is what appears to be this freedom. There's also so much plastic surgery. You can get, um, you can get the public health service to pay for your plastic surgery. Like if you have a nose that they consider like too Negro, then they will pay for you to get plastic surgery. And people just think that's normal. And, um, so it's, it's a strange mix of things as a foreigner. I felt way more comfortable in my skin and I felt that people in general feel more comfortable in their skin there. And it felt like a lot of permission because no, it's, there's not the same kind of judgment also about like, Oh, like here it's like, there's so much judgment about like, if you're fat, then you must be lazy. And that means you're bad, you know, or if you're this, then, Oh, you're skinny. You must be this. It's like there. It's just like, no, you're just like a person. Yeah. You don't have to have a label. And if you do, like sometimes the nicknames, they have lots of nicknames. People they'll call you like Gorda, like, but Flaca. (laughs) Yeah. But it's, yeah, it's just not happening at the same level of like moral judgment. Yeah, it's lovely. So, how do we reach out and connect with you? Uh, my website is magamama.com, dot com, m a g a m a m a dot com, and I'm actually making a new website. So maybe by this time this is out, the new one will be out. But anyhow, if you sign up, then there's kind of a pelvic floor walkabout. So a way to learn about your pelvic floor from the inside and understand how kegels really work and what they are and if you should be doing them or shouldn't be doing them and if they really help and all that kind of thing. And on Instagram, I'm magamamas, M-A-G-A-M-A-M-A-S. And yeah, you can write me, email me. My email is kajyoga at gmail.com. And we will put all of that in the show notes for this episode over at honorthefeminine.com so people have a really easy way to get in contact with you. And tell us about the book that's coming out in fall 2017. The book is called The Fourth Trimester, a postpartum guide to healing your body, balancing your emotions, and restoring your vitality. And what I love about it is that in one place, there's information on anatomy, like what your pelvic floor is and how it works, which normally you would only read about in like an anatomy book, which no one would read unless they're like a yoga nerd or whatever, like me. (laughs) My Um, husband's an anatomy professor. (laughs) Oh, wow. Cool. (laughs) So he has. (laughs) So he's read about it. Yeah, that's good. And then, but even, you know, the anatomy books don't have proper female sexual anatomy. But anyway, uh, that's another topic. And there's chapters on relating and how to approach conversations with sexuality and intimacy Mm post-birth. There is information on identity and like just mother identity and discovering the mother we are. There's a part on spirituality and the journey of motherhood as a spiritual path. So it's it's just really exciting to have all of that in one place Um, and information about Chinese medicine and the Ayurvedic views on postpartum. So each chapter could have been its whole own book and probably, you know, but um, because, you know, pregnant women eat books for breakfast and then you have your baby and you're like, okay, well, these books are no longer relevant. They're only about pregnancy. And then you go from there to parenting books. And there's no books about what happens to your body and what happens to your mind and what happens to your emotions. And what happens. my thought was, where was this book four years ago? (laughs) Yeah, well, there's only two books out there on, well, there's three. There's one that was written in 91. That's a great book written by Robin Lim, a midwife, but it's out of print. There's one written in the early 2000s by Aviva Ram, Natural Health After Baby, which is also a great book. And there was one published last year called The First 40, which is a cookbook, but also has some postpartum information in it. And so that's really why I wrote it, because I this is the book that I wish I would have had. Like I just I was in the dark. I prepared and prepared and prepared for birth and I set myself up and spent my life savings. And then I had the baby and I was like, wow, I had no idea. Like I just was completely in the dark about so many things. And so this is, yeah, the book that has the information that I wish I would have had. Oh, I'm excited for that. Thank you for today. Thank you. 
Hello again, everyone. Thank you for joining me today, and it was so amazing to share Kimberly with you. I took a very short course with Kimberly back in February, and she has become one of those brilliant allies this year, even in this really short course. I loved what really resonated for me in this episode was everyone is in charge of their own, own orgasm and what kind of sex would feel really nourishing and to really take some time to drop into what that would feel like and look like for you. I just think the the work she's doing is revolutionary and amazing and her new book the fourth trimester is out now and i invite you to take a look at that again she has become one of those brilliant allies as i stepped more into my sensuality and sexuality this year and i look forward to working with her more in the future so if you would like to drop in with Kimberly, you can go to the show notes for this episode where all the links are over at honorthefeminine.com. I mentioned that Ava and I will be visioning, doing a, a three-hour group visioning session, Ignite Your 2018 Vision, on Sunday, December 3rd, 2017. I invite you to join us if, if that feels exciting to you to really walk into the coming year with a, a, the big vision and the structure that you can really flow into. Uh, we love it. We've been visioning and I'm excited to share that for the first time. So if you would like to join us for that, you can go to rememberingdivineunion.com. If you would like to drop in with other podcast listeners, you can do that in our sacred space on Facebook at Honor the Feminine Daily, where I go live on a regular basis to share how I honor the feminine, and I invite you to share. As my relationship with the divine feminine has deepened and changed and grown, this has been a space to nurture that, and I invite you there to nurture your relationship with her. Finally, if you loved this episode, please share it with a friend. Again, I love Kimberly's work and, and getting it um, to all the ears that are desiring it and hearts and souls um, would feel really great. So if you loved it, please share it and subscribe. Um, I am going to be going on a little bit of a break in December and January, and then we're going to come back with a with a revived vision for the podcast uh, at the end of January 2018. And I'm super excited about that. And if you subscribe, you won't miss when that begins to happen. All right, everyone. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.